Everyone's trying to steal my style, bro. <laughs> Anyway, hey, it's good to see you on my website. By the way, there are some mock exams as well as a workshop that I'm running for 15 students. Seven of those spots have already been taken, uh, but basically that workshop is called the Thinking Lab and it's where I ask students uh, when they sign up what one of the biggest questions is for their John Monash preparation phase. If you're interested in that, you can go to my website and then sign up for that. It's 55 bucks for two hours and I literally tailor make the workshop for you and based off of your questions. So it's something that I haven't seen any other company do or anywhere else online and things like that so it's just a really nice formal way to get information and an actual solution to some of the problems from someone who's been in the same position that you have so if you're interested check out my website uh, but other than that let's just jump right into the video so today we're going to be covering science writing uh, there are two main components for the science writing segment of John Monash. If you're doing the year 11 exam, I think it's only one component. But in the year 10 entry exam, there's two components, science communication and practical writing. Usually uh, every year this kind of changes. So science writing is one of the most poorly defined segments in the John Monash entrance exam. So it's really important that you do have a good structure that will work for most things that you do. So today what I'm going to do is going to, going to go through exactly how to write a science communication essay from start all the way to finish. Let's jump right into it. So when we're writing a science communication essay, the first thing we need is an introduction. Then we need body paragraphs, and then we need a conclusion. So these are the three main segments that you have to have in every single science communication piece that you do. Now, in the introduction, what do you actually have? Well, you have the background sentence, and the background sentence is effectively the, effectively the sentence that allows you to ease into your overall essay without actually overloading the examiner right from the get-go. So in your background sentence, what you have is basically just an overview of the prompt and also any definitions of key terms if possible. Okay, so if you find that your background sentence is too long, then you can move your key terms into the sentence after and then go from there. The next thing you want to do after that is actually outline your stance. And the key thing you need to do when you're outlining your stance is make sure that this aligns with what John Monash actually would want. So for example, if the prompt is something along the lines of should governments allocate more money to space exploration, then your thing should be yes, of course. Even if you don't agree that space exploration is the thing that government should spend more money on, it's much easier to just go, okay, well, John Monash wants to output science students. Science students will go into many science fields. So if students go into things like space and astronomy and astrophysics and things like that, then it'll be easier and more optimal for them to have more extra funding in their area. Also, John Monash being a science school will most usually want more funding in any science field. So for every single should government spend more money on insert science field type prompts, you should always and definitely say yes, because you want to align with what John Monash thinks. If for someone that says, no, government shouldn't spend more money on space exploration or governments shouldn't spend more money on like bio research, you probably won't be able to get in because you're gonna be going against the values that John Monash has. So just keep that in mind when you're writing your essays. What you want to do after you outline your stance is outline your overall paragraphs, which is basically rephrasing and outlining your topic sentences. Okay. And then that is all you really need for your introduction. You can change it up a bit based off how you feel and your flow and your own style. But in general, this is basically what you want. So once you have your introduction, let's jump, jump into the BPs. Now the body paragraphs, the BPs are the segments that really vary from topic to topic, but the structure I'm going to show you is basically one that works for almost any topic. So I've done a lot of practice with students and almost more often than not, this is the structure that works out really nicely. So it's called past, present, future. So past is really self-explanatory. You basically talk about the history of the prompt. I can't spell today. History of the prompt, uh, any key discoveries. There we go. I really can't type it. Sorry, I got a new laptop and it's just like transferring everything over has been an absolute nightmare, which is why you haven't seen any videos come up in the last like three weeks because I've lost all the video footage that I've made. So now I need to go back and remake all of them. I'm not very good at technology, but yeah, anyway, any key discoveries that were made um, and also basically the, the framework uh, that we've built up from. When you're writing your BP1, just keep that in mind. It's the history of the prompt. What did we actually start with historically? And it's usually very easy to have this kind of stuff, the history stuff, because Almost every single science prompt has had some form of history for it. If your prompt is based off of, for example, water filtration, 
you can just talk about the importance of water and how we went to understand why water is so important. Uh, if your prompt is about genetic um, splicing and things like that, you can talk about the history of understanding genes. And that shows your examiner that you actually know a lot about science. A lot of people really forget that the key point in the science communication essay is to flex your science knowledge. So the math section tests how good you are numerically and it also tests how good you are under time conditions. Numerical reasoning section tests your pattern recognition skills. Your science reasoning section tests your adaptability and able like ability to problem solve and link ideas together as well as your general science knowledge. But your science writing is how you actually showcase passion in science because John Monash doesn't just want people who know science, they want people who are passionate about science. So the key thing to show passion in science is to be able to showcase how much you actually know about science outside of the curriculum, outside of the general problems that you would have done in class. That's the key thing that they're looking for. So the key point in science as is, is to flex your science knowledge. The way you can do this, and this is in my opinion, is to effectively demonstrate that you're not a one trick pony. So one trick pony is basically someone who only knows one thing and regurgitates that same information over and over and over again, right? If I was a one trick pony in like teaching, I would only be teaching like English, for example, or I'd only be teaching math, for example. I'm a one trick pony and I'm really, really good at math. But, you know, I'd like to think I'm not a one trick pony. I teach math, physics, chem, uh, English and selective entry and stuff like that as well. And I teach people how to teach and I teach companies how to teach as well. So I like to think that I'm not a one trick pony in that regard, but there are a lot of people who out there are. Right. So one trick pony is not what you want to be. You want to showcase that you're not a one trick pony by going into a lot of fields and showcasing that, you know, a good amount about them. And I'll show you how to do this in your essay as well to really separate you from the crowd. So that's BP one, the past the, the structure that you use is literally just your normal teal teal thing where T stands for topic sentence, just outlining exactly what you're going to be talking about in your paragraph. E stands for evidence, which is literally just like a case study or an analogy or some type of like data or data, okay, trend theory or data. Uh, and then explanation, basically like really link it back to the prompt. I like to say like, why is this evidence actually important for your argument and for this prompt? Okay, then you have the linking thing, basically just linking it back to the prompt one more time. Okay, because you always want to be linking back to prompt. If you just memorize an essay and copy paste it, you're not going to do very well, right? Because you always want to link back to prompt. And that's really all you do. You copy paste that for every single paragraph and then you're done. BP2 is present. Now, when you're talking about present, a lot of people think like, oh, yes, the discoveries that happened like three weeks ago, for example. I would actually say don't do that. I would say maybe go back like five, six years to get more niche uh, examples for evidence. The reason I say go back five or six years is because most students that I've actually seen, especially from other companies, whenever I do workshops and stuff for them, a lot of students, they really love talking about artificial intelligence. Okay, now I'm not here to say like AI is good, AI is bad. I think that it has benefits and also like hindrances as well. Uh, for example, most tutoring companies these days are basically using AI to create and generate questions, which I think is absolute garbage. Um, but you know, that's a different side note. Uh, but yeah, a lot of students love talking about AI and they love, I guess, having points and arguments about AI. Try not to do that, which is why I say go back five or six years, because almost every single article that I've seen nowadays has been like, oh, yes, AI in medicine, AI in engineering, AI in software, AI in law. So a lot about a lot about AI these days. Try and go back a couple of years to find something that's actually interesting uh, and then talk about that. Obviously, 2019, 2020 it might be a lot more stuff about COVID and genetics and stuff like that. But you can still find a good amount of stuff in that. So go back five or six years. And that is equivalently like present day, right? Um, also depends on how far back in the past you decide to go. If you're going to like all the way down to like the 1600s, 1500s, 1400s, uh, and you're talking about science discoveries back then, then talking about something that was maybe in like the 1900s or the early 2000s is also fine, right? So BP2 will be present. Um, and this is really just to showcase that you are aware of modern day discoveries, not just the textbook um, history or historical um, analogies. So just really showcase that you're more aware of modern day science and you're up to date with modern day science and you're not just like a 
person who's memorized stuff from a textbook, right? You've actually gone and researched articles and stuff. Last one is future. This is my favorite paragraph to really write because this paragraph is basically how will the next 15, 20, 30, 100 years look because of this um, thing, okay? Because of this like prompt or whatever you have, right? So if it's like, oh yes, like we put money into space exploration, what would the next 15 to 100 years look like? The key thing that you really want to emphasize is not just making this like a hypothetical thing. Don't just be like, oh yes, we could like be on Mars in like the next hundred years, or we could be like uh, creating a Dyson sphere around the sun, right? Don't just make it something that happens like the next like uh, hundred years as, as conjecture, because that's not what's good. What you should do instead is you should actually try and link it to other fields, okay? And what you can do is you can use modern day examples and showcase how that's, um, I guess, changed the way the field has worked okay so you might do something like oh yes through black hole research uh, we were actually able to create the groundwork for wi-fi microchips and now wi-fi microchips are utilized in modern day devices all the way through the world and so for example if there is more money based on space exploration we will be able to create more discoveries and apply them into the technology that we have today or you might go something like, oh yes, uh, through space exploration, we created imaging technology and that imaging technology is slowly transitioned into the medical field, which means that doctors can create more accurate scans at a lower risk level and create uh, an outline for a patient to actually recover after the surgery or create a more accurate diagnosis. And so going forward uh, through the utilization of these new technologies that are, the funding is going into, um, you can create uh, like more links and stuff and things, right? So something along the lines of that, it doesn't have to be necessarily like fully grounded, but I do want you to keep in mind that when you link to, to future, you should link into other fields. So this should actually be future slash other fields. And this is really, really important as a paragraph. And you can actually do this for almost every single one. So let's say that you had absolutely no idea what your prompt was about. Like you had zero clue about space exploration as a prompt, or you had zero clues uh, about biology as a prompt, which ideally you shouldn't. You should know a good amount from every single field. Uh, but let's say, just say you didn't. If you were using the structure, you would be more or less screwed, right? But you should hopefully know a good amount about the past for something or maybe even the present for something. And every time you don't know enough about a field specifically, you can just change that paragraph into a paragraph where you talk about the past, present and future and then also link to another field. So for example, the past. Galileo, um, who did work on like the telescope or whatever it was, he was able to understand mathematically the relationship between circles and things like that, for example, right? Um, Newton, who did work on space exploration, was able to create uh, his laws for kinematics after observing the space. And so if we put more funding into space exploration and get more data and research, we'd be able to understand the universe more accurately. And then that links into other fields and stuff like that, right? Uh, present, if you want to talk about, like I already talked about the Wi-Fi microchip thing, that's a pretty cool case study. They did that at CSIRO, John O'Sullivan, really cool dude. Um, haven't met him, but he did a cool, cool stuff. Google it if you want to. Um, CSIRO Wi-Fi microchip was made from reversing the signals that we got from black holes. And we use that in almost every single modern day device, which is really cool. Um, future linked to other fields, you can talk about like understanding space exploration will help us optimize the fuel consumption. It'll help us optimize the whatever we need to optimize, right? So you can always just link it into other fields if you're not sure about how to specifically talk about a certain field um, in a lot of detail. But ideally you should be able to, but if you can't, then that's what you can do. Conclusion, super, super easy two to three sentence summary. I always say that no one reads the conclusion. You just have to have it here for structure marks. Okay. And this is a really controversial opinion, uh, but I have, I'm going to defend it in case you're also thinking that doesn't make sense. I always have to write a conclusion. My conclusion is my best paragraph, right? Um, I'm not saying you sound like that, but you know, that's what most people who question me sound like sometimes. Uh, but yeah, so imagine you're an examiner, you have to read 300 essays, and you know that the conclusion, if it's a good scoring essay, the conclusion doesn't have any new information from the essay that you've already read. And if you were to read 300 of these conclusions, that would probably spend, like you'd probably spend an extra like 20 minutes, 30 minutes, 40 minutes uh, on that day reading just conclusions. 
So it might just be easier to not have this conclusion in your marking scheme because it doesn't add any like new information, ideally. And it also like doesn't really do anything for the overall essay. You just need to check to see if it's there and if it's there, you're done, right? So most examiners actually won't read your conclusion as long as you have like a good essay because you're not adding any value to it. It's just the same stuff summarized, right? Why would an examiner who's already read your essay want to read a summary of your essay? Doesn't make sense. So I say, Conclusion, no one really cares. You just have to have it there. So a two to three sentence summary just to show that there is something there is more than enough. This is assuming that you write like 30 words a sentence, right? <laughs> so it's like in reality, like close to, to like roughly a hundred word. Oh no, wait, what, what happened there? <laughs> 30 words a sentence, which is usually a hundred words uh, for the thing, right? So assuming you do that, you get like a 60 to a hundred word conclusion, um, but yeah. This is overall the structure that I would strongly suggest that you use for a science communication essay. I'll have another video up um, soon talking about my final essay that I actually wrote uh, and discussing the structure, what's good, what's bad about it, and what you should do instead. Anyway, I hope that helped. Uh, you know the drill by now. Don't like, don't comment, don't sub. Log off and do something else now. See ya.